Hey folks, Steve here with another Golden Flames video. Today we're going to be doing part two of our end of turn stage uh, pair, I guess. This should just be the one other video for the end of the turn phase. Um, and uh, the last video we, we went through Partisans, US Entry, uh, Return of Base, uh, Final Reorg, and now we're going to do Production. And obviously Production's a pretty big deal. It is probably one of the weightier parts of World and Flames in general, just because there are so many things to consider and, and, and what you have to kind of put together uh, in terms of tracking how much you have, uh, in terms of resources to build, and then what you are deciding to build. And so, uh, for me, this is going to be a while to record all of this and to think through everything so I can explain it for you. Hopefully, we can get most of this in an, an hours-long video or less. I hope. We'll see. Um, now, in other videos, I talk to production a little bit, and I talk to the fact that you need to get resources like that, resource there in France, to a factory uh, controlled by that uh, major power, and you will get a production point, which is multiplied by um, a production multiplier, which represents uh, the war footing of your economy, and that will give you the build points, the BP is needed, uh, to build units, and so th that is all still true, right? We explained that, and we set up our convoys in previous videos to allow for the transport of resources and whatnot uh, to get to those factories. So we'll we'll sort of cover that in brief here as we go. But again, if you watch the other videos, you will have understood a little bit, like for the Commonwealth, uh, the need for the convoys to be out there because they are shipping uh, resources and oil to the United Kingdom, where the majority of the Commonwealth's factories happen to be. Um, so, yeah, it should be, <laughs> should be okay. We'll, we'll get through it. Okay, one of the questions that comes up when it comes to production a lot of the time is, um, you know, new players are going to look at the map, they're going to see that there's all kinds of stuff on the map, right? Um, and when it comes to production, you know, you will have to look at, you know, what... What do I have? What don't I have? What have I lost? And figure out what your production is. And the thing is, that can seem very overwhelming, but in reality, it's not so bad once you start uh, figuring out your baseline. And once you have your baseline, what you're really tracking is changes to the baseline, changes to the variables in a formula, basically, right? That, that's what you need to worry about. Um, and there are ways that the game helps you do this, right? One of them, and I'm going to call it out on your handy-dandy player aid sheet, is on here, sort of down here uh, to the right and below the weather chart. First, there's that production multiplier uh, chart that tells you what that multiple is for each major power based on the year, uh, plus or minus any oddity, weird things like the U.S. has some special bits to it, as does the USSR. Um, and then, and you know, there's some descriptive text here to support that. Then down here, you have a resources and factories chart. And what this does is it shows for a country, or in some cases really uh, an area, uh, it will tell you how many resources and how many factories are in that region. And so it's two-column format, so different things. But just as an example, we said uh, Norway... How many factories does Norway have? None. We can look at the map and see that that is true. How many resources does Norway have? Uh, they have one, which uh, you could see at the tip of the thing right over here. Um, and now you could look elsewhere on here so you can see like it splits out. Okay, USSR has this on the Europe map and then in Siberia, which is really you know what's on the Pacific map, has these resources. And so at any time, you know, you look at what, what resources and what factories are in what countries. You can kind of use this table if you need to at a glance to understand what is there. Now, if you're just looking at the map, you know, it's kind of easy to see, right? If we looked at Yugoslavia as an example, Yugoslavia has two factories, one in Zagreb, one in Belgrade, and it has uh, three uh, resources, or I'm sorry, two resources, uh, one here and one here. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a pretty straightforward thing there uh, to, to look at, right? But once you start having counters around and there are units covering up hexes and you don't want to be lifting and shifting a bunch of counters, um, you know, the, this chart can help you understand what you have 
uh, in particular areas. Again, so that, that should be mostly um, straightforward. And so then uh, if we were looking at uh, a baseline, right? I mentioned a baseline. So what a, if you don't know what a baseline is, for whatever reason, um, it might be a term that you don't use in your, your work or your, your life, Baseline is just saying, you know, here's what normal is. So all things the same, this is normal. Here's the baseline. And every time there's a change due to a country falling or hex is taken by the enemy, and you look to do production, what you're looking for is, what has changed from my baseline? And then that becomes the new baseline, basically, right? So what all you're really doing most of the time, once things get underway, is you know what production you had, say, on turn two. You know what you had on turn one. What has changed from turn one to turn two that would, would impact your production? As long as you can maintain that turn to turn and you're just noting, oh, uh, you know, I lost uh, a resource hex in France, so France is going to have one less ability to produ produce, or, um, hey, we, we lost a convoy, we can't get that resource up here, that's going to be a minus one until I can fix that convoy. You can figure that out without too much trouble, but getting there and getting established and figuring out what the baseline is is the first challenge of production and again you try to prepare as much as you can during a setup with the convoys and everything to mostly figure this stuff out but uh, we'll look at uh, the scenario information to help us with the initial baseline so uh, looking at the sheet again I just printed this out from the campaign book in case there was a rata um, on the one, second page of it is at start production. So this is in theory uh, your baseline, but for each of these, you know, you have to still validate are the resources that are noted here getting to the factories that they need to, but it helps you just from a beginning point understand what you have. So the Commonwealth will have 22 factories. Uh, we're going to have eight oil, which we're not playing with oil rules, so to us that's just a resource, and 19 other resources, so that's 27 resources total, right? But we're not getting 27 resources to 22 factories automatically. We have to look at uh, each region sort of separately and figure out where the factories are that are actually getting resources. So the Commonwealth is probably the most difficult to do here just because they have spread out um, territory. Uh, but countries like France will be a lot easier, and Germany in particular will be pretty easy uh, to figure out what they have and what they can work with. Likewise with Italy for the most part, and the U.S. is, is going to be mostly straightforward. USSR for the most part as well. So the Commonwealth might be a great place to start for our example as we talk through it. Um, because, again, they, they have things in Canada. You have things off map. You have stuff going to the United Kingdom. Something to keep in mind is it doesn't matter where the factory is as long as it's getting a resource point. And this is one of those things that it kind of a little bit digs through immersion a little bit for you. So take Canada, for instance. Canada has a couple of factories. It also has resources that can get to those factories no problem, and then it's shipping the excess resources to the United Kingdom. Those resources that go to the factories, whatever build points are derived from that pairing, um, just go into a bucket of build points for the Commonwealth. And those Points can be used to build anything, and they might even be used to build things that would come up in the United Kingdom, or India, or South Africa for that matter. And the thing about it is, there's no need to transport those build points from Canada to the Commonwealth in order for that to occur. They're just going into one big bank of build points, um, and that's how I've always understood it. And you could probably do some house rules to figure that out differently. Um, there's probably different ways to look at it, but to my understanding, that is how it has always worked. And so you, you sort of give up that, you know, just it's, a, it's an abstraction, certainly. But the point is to get the resources to the factories. Once they're there, you're getting build points for them based on your multiplier. Wherever those factories are, they, they go to the pot and you're good to go. And you really only need to worry about shipping, if anything, those convoys shipping those uh, resources to the factories, or if you're shipping built, completed build points to a friend uh, via a trade deal or something like that. So that's really just one of those weird things. You might go, hey, that, that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure why it works that way. It, it is an abstraction, so you're not just 
you know, it's already heavy logistics uh, weight in terms of mechanics and knowing how it all works. Adding that additional layer wouldn't add as much to the game as just, hey, you need to get the resources to the factories. That's the important piece. The Atlant battle for the Atlantic, the submarine warfare, all that still works. All of the strategic warfare still works without adding that additional layer of complexity. So, um, yeah, build points are at large, but you need the resources to the factories on a local level on the map and across the world or whatever. Okay, so let's talk about how the Commonwealth is going to get its build points. We'll just go in that order in the setup chart. Technically, when you do production, both sides are kind of doing it simultaneously. It doesn't really matter. Um, and, and I guess you could try to say, like, oh, the initiative side should do it first or they should go last. Uh, but, you know, I, I, in any game I've played, you know, we're not staring at each other's hands as we're picking out units to build and stuff. We just... We get them on the build track, and that's it. And you know, you kind of see what people built later, but you're not, you know, you're not trying to meta game your production while while you're each doing production, right? I, I'm not sure how other people do it, but we, we've never really worried about doing that. We just build what we're going to build, we put on the reinforcements track, and there we go. So let's take a look at Commonwealth. One other thing I forgot to bring up before we get right into it is that the, the rule book has in here, and you can print these out, right, from the book or photocopy, whatever, they have these build charts. And, you know, you can do them by the country, by power, what have you, and record uh, the resources uh, and factories and all this stuff. You can, you can list all this stuff out, and it has listings for the different building categories, and you can mark those off with a pencil. Now, you know, this is a nice, you know, tight format of an Excel spreadsheet kind of style. Um, sometimes I just do, you know, most of the time I just do scratch paper. I have my own format that I like that makes it easy for me to read and concentrate on what I'm doing and so that I remember what I've built and, and why or whatever. And they're just really for my personal use and if an opponent really wanted to double check my work to make sure I wasn't somehow cheating or something, I could explain it to them and show them. But, um, I'm trying to think, like, do I want to do a bunch of handwritten stuff? Um, I'm not sure I want to do that and just show you on camera all the time. That doesn't seem useful. But there will need to be a little bit of writing down kind of how we're getting to where we're going to get for production. And in the future, I won't bother showing you the paperwork unless someone really cares because, again, you're going to follow these baselines. You're going to figure out what is being produced and recording what you're building and, and all that good stuff. And because we're not doing gearing limits, it doesn't doesn't really matter what we build as long as we're allowed to build it, right? U.S. can't build everything. They can only build certain things and so on and so forth. So um, just something I want to call out. You know, you can definitely use those charts in your own own game just to keep, keep your sanity and keeping track or scratch paper or, again, spreadsheets on a computer if you've got a computer nearby or you're doing Vassal or, or whatever. So, yeah, there you go. Okay, so let's... Let's get into it for the Commonwealth. So, first thing we're going to do is, uh, because we're playing with the scenario that we're playing with, we do want to take a look again at the off-map production chart. So here it says there are three factories and three non-oil resources off the eastern map edge. So, um, the three factories and three non-oil resources are kind of given here as like, we're going to get that no matter what, basically. Um, and then furthermore, they have one extra resource point for blah, 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 blah. They still need to be transported to be used. And that's what our uh, Mediterranean convoy line is for. But we still get the three factories and three, uh, three factories and three non-oil resources. So what does that give us to start with? Well, three resource to three factories, that's three production. So off map, we have three so far. So that much easy peasy as it were right so next we're gonna look at the rest of this production right so I would just want to show so we have two factories in Canada um, and if we look at our resources we know that there's at least seven or I'm sorry six resources in Canada we know that we're shipping the other four so two resources to two factories in Canada again you could look on the map and you could point it all out. I don't think I'm going to need to do that here, right? I think it's easier for folks to understand reading here. Um, and, and you can look at the map at any point and kind of see what, what I'm talking about. So that's uh, two Canadian factories that are getting their resources. So that means that we have three off-map production and now we have two Canadian production. 
So that's a total of five so far, right? Five. Use my hand. <laughs> okay, so now what? So now if I were to look at my sheet and I'm looking and I'm just going to look off camera here so I'm not constantly throwing it in front of the camera. Um, so we have 17 factories in the UK. That's really what the remainder of our factories are at, or where they're at. And what about our other resources? Well, we have two in the UK. So now that we're getting another guaranteed two, so now we're up to seven production total. And then the final question is, uh, what about the remaining 15 factories in the UK that need uh, resources? So, case in point, we're thinking about uh, our convoys that we set up before, right? So I had set it up basically to have uh, five coming through the Mediterranean from off map. So this is stuff from India, uh, other parts of Africa, whatever, coming through the Mediterranean, five, and it came through here and it comes through Plymouth. So we, were, we would get five there. And then we're getting nine from the America map, right? We're getting four uh, from Canada. That's the leftover that Canada couldn't process. And then we're getting another five in combination from Venezuela, Venezuela and uh, uh, British Guiana. So that's a total of five there. Five plus four is nine. So that's why I put, you know, we have 10 convoys in each sea zone that we need them basically to get to the UK here. They're going to port into uh, uh, Glasgow. And, but we don't have quite, we don't have 10, but we have nine. So we're effectively right now until something changes, we're missing out on one factory processing a resource. Now, we will be able to resolve that before too long, uh, but for now, we're, we're basically missing out on the one. So we're getting a total of 14 resources to the remaining 15 factories. So 14 being generated there. So again, that's 14 from uh, convoys being convoy resource convoys reaching the UK, right? 14 plus the two that are already there. So that's 16. Then we have the two from Canada, that's 18. And then five, uh, I'm sorry, three more uh, for the off map. So we are, are getting 21 production points, essentially, from, from that. Um, yeah, we're missing out on one resource, but that's pretty close to full production. That's that's great. So that's 21 production points, right? 21. I'm pretty sure. I'm make sure. 3 plus 2 plus 2 is 14. It's 21. Yes. Um, okay, so now we have 21 production points. Now what are we going to do? Well, we're going to multiply uh, by the Commonwealth's 0.5 here, so they have a 0.5 in 1939, they don't have any modifiers, and they would get some extra build points for units lost in their home country, uh, but that has not occurred, so 0.5 is our multiplier. Uh, 0.5 times 21 is going to be uh, 10, and I'll have to look at the rounding, we might round up. Okay, yeah, I had to double check, so, so 0.5 times 21 is 10.5, and that 0.5 rounds up. So for the Commonwealth, we will have 11 production points, um, 11, I'm sorry, 11 build points that we can use now to build units. Uh, so 11's pretty good um, for, for the Commonwealth, right? I mean, that 0.5 is a real bummer, right? But hey, the war is just starting. But 11 uh, build points is actually quite a bit, and we can definitely look to uh, build some good stuff. So now that we know that we have 11 build points to construct, um, now the question is going to be, uh, what do we build, right? And, and just to kind of think about things, right, if I were playing with gearing limits, I would um, be able to build whatever I wanted this turn, but then next turn, because we just started, now we've begun to be at war with another major power, uh, but next turn, we'd have to build off that gearing limit if we were playing with that option. Because we're not, we can kind of build whatever we want, whenever we want, in, in whatever mass or quantity. But we still need to think about long term, 
what are we going to build and when is it going to come in, right? So as an example, we have uh, some ships that are in the repair pool. We have some ships that are in the construction pool that we could opt to build. But because they take so long to build, it might be a good time now to build them rather than something that won't take as long uh, that we could use later, right? Um, so, you know, if we were building a ship that's in the construction pool, like that, the other aircraft carriers that are there as the Commonwealth, it's going to take, um, you know, six turns before they are off the, the shipyards, and that is going to take a long time. And if we delay starting to build those guys, um, it will be even later into the war before we get them. And so we need to be thinking about that. Obviously, as the Commonwealth, um, you are probably not going to build, we ordinarily would not build a huge amount of infantry units. Uh, we are probably, you know, want to make sure we have got plenty of naval power and we can maintain naval supremacy. We probably want to be building planes to make sure that we have uh, air supremacy. If the Germans try to uh, invade Britain, for instance, huh, who would think about that? Um, and, but, you know, again, there, there's still considerations of, well, you know, if, if, if we thought a sea lion was coming, we would probably build more ground forces for that, and that might weaken our position elsewhere uh, around Europe because we're building ground forces that are going to stay in the UK. A lot of weird considerations there. Something I'm, I'm going to just try to operate on is right now, um, I'm, as the Commonwealth, I don't know that the German version of me uh, is going to be looking to do sea line or isn't going to start building in preparation for sea line. So um, for this turn's production, I am not going to build as if I know that, right? I might suspect and, and just do it anyway, but um, I, I'll probably pick a build set here on this turn that is relatively neutral, that is just an all-around okay build. I, and again, I'm not even going to say what I'm building is a smart decision. I'm going to have to lean on some notes and player strategy notes I have to kind of help figure out, well, what do I build here in the early phases of the game? <laughs> so again, we're, we're going to start getting into these areas where like, I'm, not an ex I'm not an expert. I can help teach the game, but um, whether or not everything is the best decision possible, I, you know, that, that's hard to say. So um, let's take a look at what uh, we will opt to build here. Okay, so I think I know what we're going to do with our 11 build points as the Commonwealth, and um, nothing too, too crazy, but I want to make sure I speak through what I did, and I'm not sure the why matters so much at the moment. Um, knowing that I want to get uh, some stuff moving that, you know, ultimately I, I need to be able to uh, make use of, I decided to go and sort of have a split build profile here. <laughs> So here, let's let's take a look, shall we? Um, okay. So first things first, we're going to spend four build points to to finish or or to start the final phase of uh, the victorious uh, CV. So this unit started in the construction pool, which uh, you would see here with the C mark on it, and it would cost the second. Um, second value, uh, let's see, you're not going to be able to see that, come on, focus, 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 okay, so you might not be able to see that very well, the first number is a three slash a four, so when you build from scratch, you know, starting a ship, you pay the first cost, and it goes on the, uh, the production spiral face down, when it's done, it goes to the construction pool, you can then pay uh, after that's complete in production, the second cost, in this case a four, to be put face up on the production spiral, and when it's complete, then you get the ship. So this uh, aircraft carrier was partially uh, built or had its first phase complete, so we're going to spend four and put this on uh, the production track. Because it is coming from the construction pool, we need to do it six full turns from now. Uh, we'll finish building it now. Um, it's not the best carrier in the world, but I like having a backup, so we'll create this one just, again, for demonstration purposes, so six. So if I look at the uh, production spiral, just uh, as an illustrative example here, say the turn is September, October, we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. So we will put this guy here, and uh, there we go. So. Um, even though this is, you know, six turns from now is September, October, and this is the current turn, we still place it here because we're going to 
end up in November and December, and this will still stay there until we go the whole way around the spiral until September, October 1940. So we will know that that aircraft carrier will be done. So what else did we want to spend our stuff on? Well, we had uh, two units here in the uh, construction, or the repair pool, rather, and a uh, repair pool is a little bit different. So when you build things from the repair pool, uh, what it is is you pay the first cycle cost, so the first number before the slash, uh, to put it on the production spiral face up so it'll come up. And when you repair, it only takes uh, two turns. So uh, we'll spend five more. So we've spent, f you know, we've spent four for the Victorious. And then we'll spend uh, five more, because this one's a three, this one's a two. It's a little fuzzy. I, I know you guys might not be able to see it because my focusing problems. Um, but that'll be five more, so we'd be up to nine. And again, these are going to complete in two turns. So we'll put them uh, one, two, onto the Jan Feb uh, bar here. Now there are lanes, one, two, three, four, five, six, that you can use. So that like, oh, this was, you know, anything in this row was from three turns ago, one, two, three, you would kind of know when you built it. I, don't, I really don't bother with it very much, but, you know, whatever, we'll, we'll do it this time. So there we go. So we have two ships in the repair. Now, I picked the ships that I picked for a couple of reasons. I, I, I was thinking about trying to repair uh, some of the battleships or start to get some battleships out uh, since we started with a carrier. But here's the thing, in World in Flames, and this might be common sense to you, but just in case you're not aware, um, there are anti-submarine warfare values for different sorts of ships, and battleships tend to be the worst, while uh, carriers get a little bit, and then uh, uh, cruisers and uh, light cruisers uh, basically get better values of anti-submarine. So I'm expecting to have to deal with German and Italian submarines, so I'm going to focus instead of spending a lot of time building up big battleships, I am going to get some uh, smaller vessels that have a better chance of contesting submarines and, and, and would be better escorts for my convoy. So that's why I prepared those units rather than, say, the uh, the Queen Elizabeth, which is in here and is a, is a nice battleship and everything, but uh, I, I just have different priorities right now. I want to, I want to focus a little bit more on anti-submarine warfare because I expect that to be a thing just from the get-go right as a commonwealth i'm expecting that and then the final two points that i had i decided to chuck into a militia unit militia units now that we're at war we have them in our force pool uh militia units are great because they cost two and they take one turn to build so i could have used these other two points trying to do something else um but i figured hey might as well pop out a quick militia and just so we can start you know having some guys to, to put around the Mediterranean and, and maybe go to France, who knows what. So I went with this, and it turned out to be the uh, the uh, Glasgow uh, Militia. So not a terribly strong unit, but hey, I, I don't mind having it. And because it's a one-turn unit, it's going to go up here on the November-December uh, slice of the pie. And when we go to the next turn, November-December, turn two, and we move our guy over here, we're actually going to get that unit right away, uh, es essentially, effectively, because the very first step of a new turn is reinforcement. So the militia will get called up right away, basically, for building it. So that's the nice thing. So, okay, so that's 11 build points. Now, I did strive to make sure that I spent exactly 11. Um, it is an optional rule to save build points. There are markers for that. There's different ways you can save things. You can save oil and, and stuff like that. Um, but because I'm not playing with any of those options, I can't save build points. And so um, for me, it's just like, okay, well, then I don't want to not spend the full 11. So instead of, you know, spending 10 and having one wasted, I, I made sure that I the, the end state came out to be 11 build points. So there you go. We're, we're building some naval stuff, obviously. Uh, we're going to get a, an infantry unit. I was thinking about some air and what I realized was, well, I could I could build a fighter, but I only have one fighter in the force pool. That's my 1939 uh, force pool, and it's not a great plane. And if I wait until 1940, um, I will actually get uh, uh, more uh, more planes and, and better fighters, and that might be you know the better planes to build when we get there. So I don't know. I left that one go. I might build the the crappy fighter 
here in the November December turn just to get it out of the way and then I've made room for the 1940 units I don't know uh, you know some people can look at the starting builds and put a lot of importance on doing those initial builds you know to spec and, and it's very important and it might be true that your first builds can be very important to make sure you do what you want to do I admit I'm gonna be a little you know wishy-washy here especially as the Commonwealth because they are a faction that I'm not very well experienced with ultimately so there you go um, all right so the Commonwealth is now done with production see it wasn't that hard um, and the Commonwealth was arguably the hardest to do so now uh, we'll just go ahead down to uh, France who will be next their production multiplier is also a 0.5 so I'm going to adjust the camera here to get us back on camera just or on the map just so we can see everything a little bit better so uh, and as we look at the sheet so France has 14 factories they're all in France okay they can get an oil from Iraq, but um, I didn't put any convoys uh, out there for Iraq, so uh, no big deal. Because I'm not playing with oil, it's less important that I go for that resource. So that that's sort of, you know, if you play with oil, then yeah, getting to Iraq is more important, so you might put convoys there. And then nine other resources. Six are in France. One is in Algeria, which is down here in the corner of the map, um, or I'm sorry, yeah, down, it's just off camera, it's right here, but it's being railed through Spain to get to, to France right now. We have one in Senegal, that is one that we did set up our convoy line here, and I was able to validate, so we have a convoy down here, we're picking it up from this hex down here, we have convoys in Cape uh, St. Vincent, um, and then it's being railed through Spain right now to get to France. And then there's one off-map resource for France, but it would have required us having a bunch of convoys set up, excess convoys set up, over in the transfer box and going through the Med or wrapping around Africa, and we just didn't, we just didn't really have the convoys for that. So, so we're missing out on, on some stuff, unfortunately. Um, now, I want to double-check if there are any trade deals that aren't on here. Um, let's see. Yeah, that must be it because th this chart usually calls out trade deals. So that's it for, for France. Not much, on, honestly. And, and if we're looking at their capability, they are far below uh, maximum production making use of all of their factories. So if we look at Look at, look at this, right? We're basically getting um, six resources in France. We're getting the extra one from uh, Algeria. We're getting the extra one from Senegal, which gets us eight resources. We're missing out on Iraq, and we're missing out on the off-map. So only six resources are going to get to 14 factories. So what does that mean? Well, the extra factories don't do us much good, honestly. Um, and so what we're going to end up having is uh, six resources to six factories, that is uh, six production points, and then if you cut that in half, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's eight, eight resources getting to factories in France, right? So eight, eight production, eight divided in half, you know, times 0.5 is four. So the French get four build points, which is not much, <laughs> is not much, right? So I'll need to think about here what to do with four build points. We could build, you know, like an infantry unit. Um, but, you know, is that the best thing we can do? What else can we build in the classic game with four build points? Well, I'll answer that question here in just a second as I, uh, as I ponder what to do. Okay, France's very spiffy four build points um, are going to be spent to build this four-cost motorized infantry. It takes three turns to build. Now... Um, what well, here's the idea. It's going to take three turns to build. That's six months, but if we go by the turns, let's see, one, two, three. It'll come in in March and April, and hopefully um, we'll have it in position right in time for the likely Axis invasion of France. So this 5-5 five, five motorized infantry was the only motorized infantry left in the force pool. Um, because we're not playing with deluxe counters, so there's not artillery and other wacky stuff to build, this to me seems like an okay choice. Um... Now, I'm not building any militia, though I could, because they only take one turn to build. So I can wait until maybe January or February to build uh, those militia units 
or maybe I'll wait until next turn to build those militia units and then free up production for um, some some other guys, right? Now, there's sort of, you know, will it be worth the Commonwealth um, lending any build points to the French or anything like that, um, you know, knowing that the Fran that France is probably going to fall anyway, so it's a matter of when. I don't know. There's different strategic decisions there you could look at and say, well, it'd be better to better to keep, you know, funnel resources into France and keep it up, or don't waste those resources, use those on, on, on powers that are still going to be around and can fight when France goes down. I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is, but we're going to build this motorized infantry. So I'm going to go one, two, three uh, on the uh, March, April slice of the pie, and that's it for France. So France production is complete. Um, let's move on. So if we're just going in the order, again, I'm just going in the order here. If you're playing with your buddies, then, you know, you, you, you will all be doing this production stuff. And I, again, I'm not sure that the order ultimately really, really matters. Um, so now we have Germany. Now, Germany is going to be a little interesting. Germany has some trade deals going on both with uh, neutral powers that are not in the game. They also have an agreement with uh, the Soviet Union. We also know that uh, Norway is a little more friendly with us, and that could be uh, an important thing here um, for just the general uh, resource input here. So if I double check, and, and this is the case where it's like, hey, this might actually matter. Um, And what I wonder is, so we had this Norway reaction, right? So, while neutral, Norway has a trade agreement with Germany. And I wonder, does that happen now? Or not? Do we get the resource now? Because that's the real question. I mean, I, I would say that the Germans should get it, um, but I can also understand why you wouldn't let the Germans get it. Yeah, I'm trying to see. I, I don't. I'm not sure there's anything against it. So I'm gonna say that the Germans get uh, get a trade agreement. I think that's I think that's valid. Um, okay, so let's see what that changes about our general baseline here, right? So let's just review. Germany production multiplier is 0.75. That is better than the Western Allies for sure. They have 23 factories. Uh, they're all in Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia. So this is going to be the thing. Now, we don't have a big colonial empire, so everything we're getting is going to be very condensed and easy to calculate. So we obviously have 23 factories, nothing too crazy with that. We have six oil. So that's one in Germany, one in Austria, two from Ruma Romania, and two from the USSR. All of that is traveling via rail, uh, via land, so we don't need to worry about convoys, which means we're going to get all six of that oil. And we're going to get 19 other resources, so 8 in Germany, 1 in Czechoslovakia, 1 in Hungary, 3 from Sweden, 1 from Turkey, 5 from the USSR. Uh, and now we're going to get an extra one uh, from Norway. So that actually brings us up to 20 general resources. And right now um, we have more resources than... Or no, we don't. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, I guess so. So, yeah, 20, 26 resources to 23 factories. So we have more resources than we can process right now, thanks to that. Um, and here, if you were playing with a deluxe game, you'd probably be saving um, oil and things like that. But uh, we're not playing with that role, so it doesn't matter. I'll point out that we can get the Norwegian resource because it is traveling here by rail through, it can go through neutral countries like Sweden or it can go through the port. Either way, we have five convoys in the Baltic Sea that can take on both the uh, the uh, three 
uh, resources that we're getting from Sweden, uh, as well as uh, the uh, excuse me the the resource from Norway. That's four. We have five in the in the Baltic Sea. We're good to go there. So uh, yes. So there we go. Twenty six resources to uh, twenty three factories. So what does that leave us with? Right. We get we end up with twenty three production points. Right. 23 production points, and gosh, I'm going to cheat and use a calculator just so I can see the, the numbers here. So 23 production times 0.75 is 17.25, not enough to round up. So Germany has 17 build points, but we have that trade deal with the USSR. They're getting something too, minus two build points to the USSR. So we get 17 from all of our production and then we're going to give two to the USSR so that leaves us with 15 build points more than anybody so far right but Germany's ready to rock and roll so 15 build points now um, there was not a case where the Germans were going to get a free freebie for uh, destroying or having lost a unit uh, in uh, Poland oh my gosh Poland Oh my gosh, Poland. I forgot Poland. Uh, so I was going to say, like, you know, had, had these guys died in Germany, we'd get a free build point, but they did. They, this, these were the casualties from Poland. And we'll set them aside to go back in the force pool when I go to pick new units. But we forgot about Poland. So what? What? what's in Poland, right? Um, now, it, Poland hasn't technically been conquered, but if we control the territory, we control the stuff for production. Um... So let's see, we get another resource, and another resource, and one red factory, and that's it. And if you ever needed a check, right, I had to flip around, look at some units. Again, we can use our player aid chart to simply validate, right, what do, what do we get for Poland? So there's... Three factories total, two, uh, and there's a key, blue, one red, where are we at? I lost it. There we go. And two resources. So we get the two resources, because we control them, and we get another factory. That's the difference between blue factories and red factories, right? And just to show uh, the, the illustrative example here, right? Here's Prague. You see one of the smokestacks is kind of blue-black. The other one is like a red-brown color right there in Prague. That red factory can be used by an enemy who's conquered it or has taken it. They don't get control of every factory. You know, then you'd, then you'd have an unrealistic um, snowball effect of a, a economic improvement, which wasn't really conceivable. What the game does, it does provide some factory, some economic value can be used by the conqueror, and that represents the red factories. So what does that, what, so what does that do to our baseline even... even even further, right? So let's just rewind in time for a hot second. So what we actually have is we have 27 resources to 24 factories, right? And 24 factories um, are getting resources, so that's 24 production points. 24 times 75 percent uh, is 18. So that is a big, that's not a big difference, but it's a significant one. So I'm just making a note here. Yeah. So 18 build points. And again, we're going to send two to the USSR. So we actually have, because we've conquered Poland, we get an extra build point. And you might not think that that's that big of a deal, only one build point, but it piles up over time. And it's significant that we can increase our rate of production over time as the axis. We really need every build point that we can get, and the Allies are going to look to deprive the Axis of every build point that they can get. Man, I can't believe I almost forgot Poland. Oh, God, Steve. Steve, you got to pay attention, bud. All right, so there we go. Uh, that is 16 build points for Germany, and we need to think about what we're going to build, right? Um, now, we know we've got a sub that's uh, being looked on, or we, we got some stuff on the reinforcement wheel coming. We've got some paratroopers coming. Uh, you know, we've got... Uh, some 
bombers come and get a sub that's going to go in the construction pool, some other units that we're just going to get. We do have some units in the construction pool if we wanted to build up our navy or improve our navy. That might be something to think about. And of course, because we're doing a sea line strategy by, by vote and consideration, or at least we're going to start building towards it, we need to think about what we're building to support that eventual sea lion activity. And so I've got to make my, my builds really conform to that. It's going to be very important. But 16 build points, we got a lot to play with, but we've got to make sure we pick what we're getting very carefully. So I will be right back. All right, so these are the builds I'm selecting for Germany this turn, and I want to make sure I explain my thought process here. Because we're not playing with the Ships and Flames expansion, there's not an extra German amphibious transport that we could build. So we start with one, we start with a transport. That's our basic sea lift. It takes time to expand that, and I'm not sure that we, that we really have the timetable to build any more transports, and there's not going to be any more amphibious landing units coming for a while. Um, but some things that are sort of playing to our benefit and, and we can address. So uh, we do have one air transport plane that is allowed to drop paradrop troops, paratroopers. And we do have paratroopers coming as reinforcements on the March-April turn from scenario setup. So that existing uh, transport plane was kind of positioned to help us do a Norway landing. But since we're not going to do that, that plane is still there on the board. You can see I'm building one here, and I'll explain that in just a second. So the considerations for sea line right now are, do we have the sea lift to get units there for the initial invasion? The answer is... Yes, yeah, somewhat. We've got the amphibious units, and, and we will eventually be able to get marine units. But here's the thing about marine units. So marine units are, are basically the, the best units to do amphibious invasions. Go figure, right? Um, but the Germans can't build any until 1940. That's when they enter the force pool. So we can't spend any production on marines yet. They're just simply not available. Um, there are conceivably divisions that might be able to be buildable, but we're not playing with divisions, right? It's just the classic game. So our options are limited, but we do have some things that we can build that can help us along the way. First, I'm just building uh, another infantry unit, and it turned out to be a decent one, 6-4. We're building that guy to replace the one we lost in Poland. That's just to kind of help make sure we've got enough forces across the board to do the things we need to be able to do, right? Next thing I'm building is a mountain unit. Now it's decently strong, it's a 5-4. There is a special reason why I'm deciding to build that mountain unit. That is because uh, air transports, uh, besides doing paratroopers, they can actually transport units by air. But in the classic game, uh, the only other unit that can be transported by air really is a mountain, mountaineer uh, unit. So we are going to use a, another air transport plane that we're building to be able to transport that unit uh, eventually to the United Kingdom. So the idea here will be we'll eventually, hopefully, make a landing on the, the British Isles. And then as we expand our beachhead and take more hexes and have room to place more units, uh, we'll continue to use our sea lift to ferry more guys over as we can, but we'll um, look to just increase the rate and use an air transport to move these Mountaineer divisions in as well. And that might enable us to uh, do a little bit better once we're in the northern parts of the UK. Um, I mean, that the, the value of Mountaineers and Mountains really comes down to defense, but hey, it doesn't hurt to have a guy who can really hold the line up there. So we're doing that now. Uh, something you're going to notice is, um, you say, Steve, if you've got 16 build points, that's 3 plus 4, uh, that's 7 plus 6 is 13, and then you have a 2, that's 15, plus 4 is 19, how is that right? Well, we're actually going to make use of a special rule, which says that the first time the Germans attempt to build the Lufthansa uh, air transport, uh, they get to build it for three build points instead of six because I, I guess prior to the war they were already working to convert a commercial fleet into air transports for the military so there's a special rule uh, you won't find this in the print rule book this was added as errata because um, I think it was intended to be this way but it didn't make it and it's not an optional rule so I get to make use of it I did have to because there's errata on the counter um, and I 
I have the fixed counter in my deluxe game, um, but not in my extra set of counters here. I had to cross out that paratroop uh, symbol. Um, there's supposed to be a red line saying, you know, you, you can't do para, para drops with that plane, uh, but the errata is missing red ink, or this counter is missing red ink, basically, and that's why it's not there. So, ordinarily, you wouldn't even see a paratrooper symbol there. Uh, a air transport without the symbol with a cross through it can para drop. I don't know, it's, it's weird. Anyway, point is, he can't do para drops, but he can do air transport. So, we're going to build him for the cheap. So he's only three instead of six, and he will look to air transport that mountain unit down the road uh, to help our reinforcements. Hopefully he won't get shot down, but the idea is we'll have another avenue to drop guys into, uh, into the British Isles. I'm going to get this subunit. This was in our construction pool. This is one that I drew for the randomly to put in the construction pool at the beginning of the scenario. It's a pretty good sub. And so we're going to spend two uh, production points to put it on this production spiral for its second phase. Uh, and we, we will get it in three turns. So we will, we will get this guy uh, for use in, in a few turns. So we'll have a couple of subs and we'll maintain that threat of hitting the uh, Commonwealth's shipping lanes and all that good stuff. And then finally, um, I'm spending four points to get our good... Stuka bomber because I didn't draw it randomly before and we're gonna need that guy no matter what we're gonna need to use him in France We're probably gonna need to use him uh, hitting the UK all around just a very useful plane We need to get that and we need to get him going no matter what for sure so that ends up totaling in terms of the the build point expenditure uh, 3 plus 4 is 7 plus 3 is 10 uh, plus 2 and 4 is 16. So that's what we had, 16 build points left over from the trade agreement with the Soviet Union. So we will put these on the production spiral. Easy peasy. They don't, you know, they won't all show up uh, at the same time, obviously. So there will be um, a, a staggered or reinforcement of these guys, but um, again, it doesn't matter a whole lot because uh, most of the action will be after all of this. So it looks like our plane will arrive, our transport plane will arrive in May, June. We probably won't need it until July, August anyway. So there we go. All right, let's get you zoomed out here. All right, so there we go. Germany is done. We, we've created some things. Now, um, you might be thinking, well, Steve, maybe you should have built some mech units or maybe some more armor. Uh, we will. We, we will certainly do that, uh, but you can't do any amphibious invasions with armor, and uh, you've got to be able to do it with infantry, so we need to make sure that we have the ability to get those guys over there. Uh, we will look to continue to build out our force pools for sure, but I think, you know, since I can't build my marines and I can't build my amphibious units, I, I want to at least make sure uh, I can build with what I've got, so we'll, we'll look at it, uh, we'll look at it that way. Um, the only thing, I guess, if I really wanted to switch it up, you know, instead of building that plane, I could have looked at building uh, a mechanized unit, but I don't know. In my mind's eye, I keep thinking, well, I really should have built another armor unit, but, you know, that, that armor unit would be useful if I knew for sure I was going to go into 1941 with a Barbarossa, but, you know, we're not doing that, so... Um, Maybe the time the time pressure there isn't quite what it could have been. We'll see. We'll see how it all plays out. We've still got plenty of armor core to use, and uh, we'll seek to do that. So, okay, Germany is done. So now, uh, let's see, where did I put my sheet of paper? Now we have Italy. Now, Italy is going to be pretty easy. Uh, so Italy has 0.75 production multiplier. They have 11 factories. They are all in Italy. They're getting two oil, one from Romania trade agreement and one from the USA. The USA trade agreement is still in effect and all of the convoys are there in place. So they are definitely going to get those resources. And then they have six other resources, three in Italy proper, one in Sardinia, which uh, we are transporting via convoy there. Uh, and then uh, two from the USA, which again, we're covering, but we're going to lose one build point to the USA, right? 
So what does that mean? We have eight total resources with, with uh, 11 factories, right? So that's uh, eight production points, right? That's, that's the max that we can get. We're not using oil rules. So eight resources to 11 factories is just eight production points. Times 0.75 is six. And then uh, we're going to give one back to the USA. So we're going to end up with five build points as Italy. Make sure I got that right. 0.75 times 8 is, yeah, that's, that's 6 minus 1 is 5. So 5 build points is Italy. Now, as an Italian player, you're probably wanting to coordinate with a German player and figuring out what, what can I build. And if we're going, you know, we're having a secret chat, and we're saying, okay, we're going to do sea line then the Italians will also need to prep and help support that attack on, uh, uh, on Britain or, and or Spain, Gibraltar, etc. And so they'll similarly need to have their builds associated uh, with those end goals. So I'm going to go figure out what we're going to do with our measly five production points. It'll probably be an easy choice. We'll be right back. Okay, so that choice ended up being not quite as easy as I thought. It turns out that the Italians have a marine unit in their starting uh, force pool to build. So here it is. It is a 1939 uh, Marine Corps. Cost five. Takes three turns to build. Is okay strength, but is importantly a marine unit, which is obviously the best unit for uh, amphibious invasions, right? So why not build it? Well, it takes three turns to build. So if we started building it now. Uh, we would get it to, well, we'd get it in March, April, which might be a little early. Instead, I think what we want to do is get some ships going because they take a little bit longer. Um, and, and these will help our cause later down the road, but we'll, we'll get it started. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start building a new sub and an amphibious landing craft, amphibious transport. So their costs are three and two for the first cycle, so that's five. They're going to take some time to build, right? Four turns and three turns for the sub. And when they're done in three and four turns, they're only halfway done. And I'll have to continue to, to build them. But uh, the, the transport's going to be useful. It'll be a while before we really get it. In fact, it'll be you know probably 41 before we can really use it. But... Um, you know, if we end up having to do the Sea Lion in 41, then the transport will be there. Um, the Italians start with regular transports, so we could use the Marine then, but we'll wait until next turn to build the Marine. I want to make sure we get these ships going, because they take so long to build. The earlier we get started with them, the, the better. Now, is this the best thing that the Italians could be building right now? I don't know, but we'll, we'll start with that, right? Um, again, the idea is, you know, if you're going to do Sea Lion, you got to get everything lined up for that, and you can't waste time. Where if we were not doing Sea Lion, we could think things differently. We could maybe build some different units. I'd maybe focus more on uh, on naval bombers to help control the Mediterranean. We'll probably still do that to some degree, because, hey, naval bombers can be used in the south or in the north, right? It doesn't really matter. So, okay, there we go. Uh, the Italians are done. They are building some naval units now. We're going to look at uh, the, uh, the U.S. Now, uh, the U.S. Um, I have misplaced my sheet of paper. Okay. <laughs> so, the U.S. has some restrictions. As we covered in a previous video, they can't build everything that they want. Uh, and they have a very low production multiplier of 0.25, so quarter. Um, that's because they are very far away from the war. And then also, because we're playing the Europe-only scenario, um, what we're actually going to do is split American production in half. So this is um, sort of part of the special rules uh, of, the, uh, of the game, basically, that um, I'm trying to find it on here. Oh, gosh darn it, where was it? Sorry, I'm, try I'm trying to just make, make sure I'm playing everything right. You know how it is. There it is. Okay. During production step, the U.S. halves all of her build points. 
including those given to her in trade agreements. So, and they have a very nice example here. First turn, and this is almost like, hey, this is what we're going to have. First turn, the USA has 39 resources going to 40 factories, uh, providing 39 production points, times 0.25, times half again, plus the, the half from uh, Italy. So make sure you, know, you remember your order of operations, right, kids, uh, from elementary school. That plus 0.5 is the half uh, for the, uh, the trade that it's getting. So if we look here at the USA, they're getting one build point from Italy, right? But you're applying that half to uh, the the one also. They're just they're just labeling the formula a little bit differently. So it's 39 production points times 0.25 times half again. They get the half for the one from Italy, and they're going to get five build points. So it's 5.37 rounded to the nearest whole number. Now, are we are we sure that we're going to get all of that? Well, let's just do a quick double check, right? We can double check all this. 40 factories in the U.S. A whole bunch of factories, right? Holy crap. Uh, 17 in the USA of uh, oil and three from Venezuela. Well, um, are we getting our three from Venezuela? Yes, we are. I put the convoy out for the Venezuelan oil. So we are getting uh, all of that, 19. And then we're getting, uh, but we're, we're sending one to Italy. That's right, that's right. So um, that would be 19 oil. 22 other resources, so 24 in the USA, we're sending two to Italy, so that's already subtracted out. So we have the, uh, the 22, we, we add that together, and uh, I guess, yeah, boy, the, the game probably looks at it a little bit differently than, than we do. Um, so the 19 oil, uh, 40, yeah, we're actually getting um, uh, 40. I wonder what their calculation is missing here. 39 resources going to 40 factories. Am I, am I mathing right? I'm assuming I'm mathing right. 22 plus 19, yeah, that's 41. Um, so we have four, 40 factories getting 40 resources. Um, so that would be uh, 40 production. Um, but we half that. So it's going to be, or we quarter that, I'm sorry. Uh, so that will be 10 production. Then we half it uh, to 5, and then we get a plus 0.5 from Italy, which rounds up. So we're going to have not 5 build points like in the example, and I, and I assume it's because of some shenanigans around whether or not they're pulling the Venezuelan resources. But um, for our purposes and how we've set up our convoys and calculated it, yeah, we're, we're getting... Uh, 41 resources to 40 factories, that's 40 production, cut in half, well, quartered and then cut in half, I uh, would be 5, plus the 0.5 from Italy is 6. So 6, you know, rounded up to 6 build points. Whew, whew. The trade agreement with Japan is ignored, so that's left out of this, and, uh, yeah, before modification, blah, 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 right. All right, so... The, uh, the U.S. has six build points to work with, and again, there are some tremendous restrictions on what they can build. They can't be building a whole bunch of uh, infantry ahead of time, um, so we're probably going to focus a bit more on naval and air type stuff. So I'm going to take some time to figure out what we're going to do with the six build points, and then uh, we'll be back and we'll look at uh, the USSR. Okay, so for the Americans, here are the restrictions that, that are in place right now. So only one infantry or cap per turn, um, and it has to be infantry. I can't start building armor. I can't build amphibious landing craft, and amphibious transports, I mean, whatever. And I can't build uh, four-turn land bombers, the big, big strategic bombers. Um, so really, I'm going to be focusing most of my production early game uh, on the naval aspect so I can build up the American Navy. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to end up wasting a build point, but I couldn't figure out a better way to do this. I, if, I, if I were playing Deluxe, I'd get to save the build point, and I wouldn't care. Here, I can't still save the build point, so I don't know. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to start building um, a carrier, and I'm going to start... Uh, yeah, I think that's what we're going to do. 
Um, and I'll start building a regular transport. The transport will get done sooner than the aircraft carrier, but um, just, just to get going. I mean, we can't build amphibious transports, but I can build regular transports, and we will want to, we'll want to have those because we will need to be ferrying American units across the Atlantic Ocean eventually, so just having our transports in robust volume will, will help us um, down the road. So uh, we're going to put the transport three turns ahead, one, two, three, and then the, uh, the new uh, aircraft carrier, which I should point out is the, uh, the Hornet. The Hornet will uh, be out here as well. Um, now, it, in, you know, having carriers might not be as important uh, in the European theater as the Pacific, but I at least want to have some carriers there. I'll probably also want to build some surface combat ships, um, you know, as we go. But uh, for now, we'll we'll start building those guys. And, you know, folks are looking at my builds and thinking, I don't know about that, Steve. Let me know in the comments. I'd be interested to hear what people think. Um, somewhere in one of the annual magazines for World in Flames, there's, like, guidance on, or, or at least, like, people talking about their starting builds, and I never really focus too much on those articles, so I don't know. Um, just trying to think ahead, and that seems easiest uh, to figure out, right? Let's build some Navy, since it takes so long. It, it's good to do it early game if you're going to do it. Um, we got that going. So the Americans are done, and now we move on to uh, the sort of final piece of the production puzzle here, which is uh, the Soviet Union. So um, there is a point about off-map production here. So uh, the USSR has seven factories and basically 17 other resources off the eastern map edge. Uh, during July, August 1941, Iran will have been conquered and uh, the Soviets will get another one. So that's, that's just straight up off-map. But as we look at the USSR, a couple of things. So USSR is also uh, afflicted by a, a smaller production multiplier of 0.25. Um, we can see there's 30 factories, 16 in the USSR, 7 in Ukraine, which is still technically part of, as I look at the map, I mean, it's part of the Soviet Union, so I'm not sure why they're making a distinction there. But uh, there you go, so 16 in the USSR, 7 in Ukraine, Seven off map has been has been discussed, or you know, a second ago, right? When we talked about seven factories off map, um, so that's straightforward for us. Uh, Thirty factories, eight oil, uh, eight in the USSR, six off map, two going to Germany. So that's what factored into that number, uh, and fourteen other resources with uh, five in the USSR, three in Ukraine, eleven off map and five going to Germany. So if we add all of that up, right, we're going to end up with, um, because we're not playing with the oil rules, it's 22 resources to uh, 30 factories, right? 22 to 30 factories, which means we only get uh, 22 production. Uh, 0.25 of that is going to be a little over five, I think. times 0.25, uh, five and a half. So it is enough to get six. Uh, so six build points. And then we get two from Germany. So, yeah, let me just double check. So 20, 22, uh, yeah, 22 resources. 22 times 0.25 is five and a half up to six. And we get two more, so eight. Eight build points for the Soviet Union. And uh, we will figure out what to build with the eight. Um, obviously, you know, the Soviet Union has limited forces on the board. They they will get plenty of units as reserves, but it wouldn't hurt to build up some stuff now with those eight points. The question is, what do we do with those eight points? I'll be right back. Okay, so uh, knowing that the Soviet Union doesn't really know what the Germans are planning, the Soviet Union has to kind of believe that they will be at war with Germany at some point and have to kind of think in terms of those uh, things for production. But either way, um, sometimes what you build is the, as the Russians will just work out just fine. So this is what we're going to build. With our eight points, we're going to build armor and a garrison. Now, uh, the armor is going to be useful in a couple of tight particular spots on the east front. 
uh, to negate German armor and just help slow them down a little bit. Um, though they are expensive, but, uh, you know, they're okay units. This one was a 6-6, six, six, it turned out, and then I pulled a garrison of 5-1. Garrison's just going to be good to put in a couple of place, anchor them in certain cities like Odessa that are important to hold as long as possible. Um, so, just working on building up our forces. Nothing too crazy here. And as, and as the case might be for a while, you know, there's not much to worry about um, for the immediate future, uh, not until 41 at least, right? If you're the Soviet Union player, you're thinking about that. Um, unless the Germans go crazy with a 40, 40 setup, but that's not what we did, right? Um, they're all set up there in Finland, so the idea is we go get Finland, knock that out or figure that out, try to get down into Romania, do the same thing. Probably should have done Romania instead of Finland, but whatever. Again, it demonstrated just trying stuff out fun here, guys. Um, and then, you know, some of these units I'm going to build, I'm going to put on the border because we just need to make sure that we have, regardless of whether or not we know sea lions coming, we need to maintain that garrison value. We, and we need to even add it up because if we think, oh, the Germans are going for sea lion, at some point we need to apply pressure to the Germans and we might even declare war on the Germans. And to do that, we're going to need a high garrison value ourselves. So if we can start building up units there that aren't needed for Finland or Romania, um, then we're going to try to do that, right? Okay, so everyone is done with production now. Amazing, right? <laughs> it didn't take too long. Um, the explanation took more time probably than it, than it really took to figure it all out and do it. And if I were playing by myself again, it would be relative, you know, without recording it and talking to you guys about it, it would go very, very quickly. In real play, it tends to go pretty quick, especially if you're only playing one or two powers and you're in a group, then each player's just worrying about that individual faction and it's pretty straightforward from there. So... Uh, okay, so we're done with that, and uh, we're going to go to the what, what is really the last phase of the end of turn stage, which is the peace phase. And looking at the sequence of play very quickly, um, what this is going to be is uh, conquest, allied minor support, any mutual peace, any Vichy declaration, any liberation, and any surrender of a major power. So I'm going to tell you, no one's going to surrender right now, no major powers. There's no liberation, that's when you, you know, take back a conquered country, you can liberate it, and it's back in the game, but that's not relevant here. We're not in Beachy yet, so we're not declaring Beachy. No one's going to declare a mutual peace at this point. That's something you can opt to do, but it is only really relevant maybe between Russia and Japan sometimes. Allied minor support is just a check to see, did the Allies commit to defending a minor nation? And if they did, that has a U.S. entry impact. Um, I can't remember if it's positive or negative. Uh, I'd have to go look at that. Really, the only thing that matters here is the conquest uh, piece of the puzzle. Now, when we look at Poland, again, it, it, it's now, you know, we make that determination, did we conquer Poland? Well, yeah, we did, right? In order to conquer a country like that, we, we needed to take, you know, all of its factory hexes and, and its capital, if it has one. Um, and, and we did that. So, so the only thing is, you know, we got that unit there. Uh, and he's um, <laughs> all, all by his lonesome. Now, if you go to this, this section of the rule book, there, there are kind of a whole smattering of rules that cover uh, some different things, um, again, that we're not going to cover here. But what we're just going to look at here is we're, we're looking at, okay, here's the, the peace phase, conquest, um, blah, 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 special cases uh, for territories, which we aren't really going to worry about for right now. Um, territories are places that are smaller than minor countries. We're not dealing with Italy, which has special surrender rules, but you conquer any other home country if you control its capital, plus every printed factory hex in that home country. Blah, 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 the conqueror is Germany because they, they were the ones who did it, right? So what are the effects? First, destroy all printed fort hex sides in the country. No need for that. Next, remove from the game all the conquered home countries, land and aircraft units in the conquered home country. So uh, we will we will do that. We're going to remove from the game this cavalry unit that was left. I'm going to just set it down for a hot second. Um, we're going to remove from the game all of its land and aircraft units not on the map. So the force pool of the Polish will go away. Uh, we're going to remove any naval units in its force pool, so, yeah, there wasn't anything left there. Um, 
if there were any units from the conquered side in that country that aren't at war with the conqueror, they are now placed at the production circle, so that just forces interlopers out there. Um, if this is the first time the country has been conquered, it loses control of every hex left in its home country or territory. Um, every one of its hexes occupied by land or aircraft units or their zogs become controlled by that unit's uh, power. So if there was somehow some allied units, they might be able to hold on to a hex there, but uh, it's not really relevant here. Um, blah, 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 blah. Now, there are two types of conquest. There's incomplete conquest and there's complete conquest. Incomplete conquest matters more for powers that are bigger um, and have minor countries that belong to them, um, aligned nations. If, uh, and we'll see an example the difference of this when we invade the low countries, but for Poland, because Poland didn't have any minor countries associated with it, it was just Poland's the minor country, and that's it. That That's all the country has is Poland itself. It, it doesn't have any um, minor partners, countries that it's a member of. It is completely conquered. When we go to do the Netherlands, we'll find that the Netherlands will become incompletely conquered, and that will have a different um, net effect. But I'm just going to read from the complete conquest section here. Uh, when, a no, when a major power or minor country no longer controls its own or any home country aligned prior to 1939, it has been completely conquered. Um, a completely conquered country is at peace with everyone it was at war with, remove its naval units from the forest pools and all of its land and aircraft units from the game. It no longer receives any annual additions to their force pool and any of the units on the production circle, uh, naval units on the production circle and construction transfer reserve and repair pools become controlled by whoever conquered its last home country. All on-map naval units of a completely conquered minor country become units of their aligned major power. But again, we don't have any of that for the poles. And until liberated, all on-map naval units of a completely conquered major power, that does not, that's not relevant here because it's a minor power. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. Um, there's nothing left to say here because Poland is the, the first country to fall and it is really a small country with no colonial possessions or anything like that. So, now we can say Poland is officially conquered. Yay. And that's it. And then the very final part of the turn is a victory check. No reason to do a victory check. We are just at the beginning of the game, guys. Okay. There we go. End of turn stage complete. In fact, that's turn one of World in Flames complete. At least for the European theater. Um, so there we go, guys. We're, we're done there. The next time we do an end of turn stage, I will not go through that in such, you know, in-depth steps for you, now that you understand how it works and, and what to be thinking about, I won't spend as much time covering it, but I wanted to make sure the first time through, we really explored all of that stuff. And the camera screwed up. I was feeling so good. I was on a roll there, wasn't I? Um, okay. So, I wanted to make sure I went through all of that with you so you guys could see all those steps. When we get to incompletely conquering the Netherlands, I will go in more depth on what incompletely conquered means, and what does that mean for a player and, and where things are at. But in, in all of this case here, um, Poland was completely conquered, so we covered that. Again, in future turns, we won't spend as much time on production, we won't spend as much time on everything else, until something drastically changes and needs to be described in further detail. Um, and we're going to start to, you know, see more exciting things start to happen. So, you know, when the Germans invade France, we might slow down and really step through the invasion of France as we go. Uh, but, you know, I'll try not to have too much of that, you know, really slow stuff. Um, at this point, we're kind of breaking into just playing the game as a session report than an instructional video. But there'll be plenty to learn along the way if you want to watch and you're new to the game and want to see how things play out with my probably suboptimal play decisions and strategy and all that good stuff. So, next video, when I can next record it, we will be looking at the next turn. We will be looking at November, December 1939. It's going to very likely be a very fast turn because the weather will be bad. There won't be a whole lot for us to really worry about, but we'll work our way through it there and, and move quickly into 1941 if we can, get through those winter months and start looking at uh, the action around Denmark, Netherlands, Belgium, and eventually France in 40. So uh, if you like this video, hit like. If you'd like to see more, hit subscribe. 
otherwise, uh, thanks for watching. I appreciate any comments in the comment section down below. Let me know what you think. Let me know what your strategic uh, decisions are when you play World in Flames, if you're a player already. Um, and let me know if there's any gotchas that uh, maybe I'm not thinking about, because even though I've played World in Flames a number of times now, you know, hey, I, did, I miss stuff. I forget stuff. So let me know. Um, until next time, guys, take care. Keep on gaming.